Okay, so let's just go over the agenda briefly. First, we will do a brief introduction to our Eco Ambassador Program and the partners who are involved. We'll have a little intro from SDGs today as well. Um, and then we'll do a brief recap of the workshop series that we've had so far, including uh, how to find resources on SDG 14 and getting started with ArcGIS Online. And then we'll have a section about uh, tips for great storytelling. So this, this whole summer program is about storytelling for the SDGs using maps. So we're gonna have some great speakers talk to us a bit about storytelling. And then we'll get into an introduction to ArcGIS story maps. What is it? And then we'll go through a demonstration of how to use the platform. And then we'll, we'll have a discussion where you're welcome to share any questions and ideas and hear from some of our great speakers and experts we have with us today and then we'll uh, wrap up and talk about some of the next steps in the program. So let's go ahead and get started. So I know many of you have heard this before, but just a quick refresher about our Eco Ambassador Program. Uh, so this is a program that we've been growing at the Center for Sustainable Development for a couple years. The goal of the program is to equip young people with knowledge and skills for conducting scientific research and advocating for both individual as well as systemic solutions for the sustainable development challenges that we see in our communities and around the world. And so we try to merge both scientific training and the skills for conducting research, identifying research questions on these different issues of sustainable development. And we help connect young learners with some of the experts in our network at the Earth Institute, as well as with our partner organizations. And then we also combine that training with training in advocating, mobilizing, uh, building that grassroots support through different organizing uh, approaches and storytelling so that we can take the, the solutions we're learning about through our scientific research and help them get implemented by advocating for them. Um, so that's a little bit about our program. And this summer, we're very excited to be partnering with SDGs Today, which is part of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Global Schools Program, ESRI, and Mission 4.7 to help bring this program where we're using ArcGIS online to help tell these compelling uh, space-based stories to help promote solutions to SDG 14 challenges. Um, and we have Miriam Urbiti with us today from SDGs Today, and she's going to tell us a little bit about their work and some of the opportunities that this summer program can possibly connect you to. So, Miriam, if I can ask you to please share. Sure. Thank you, Tara. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Miriam, and uh, as Tara mentioned, my work focuses on a program called SDGs Today at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, in the past few workshops, you may have heard a little bit about what we do from my colleagues, Ismini and Anella, um, but I wanted to talk about the storytelling aspect of our work today. Uh, we launched SDGs Today, which is a data platform uh, for the SDGs exactly a year ago in partnership with ESRI and the National Geographic Society. And our goal is to advance the production of real-time and timely data for the SDGs. So a lot of our work is about exploring new methods of data collection and analysis, visualizing the data and trying to present it in an easy to understand way on, on the platform. Um, early on in our work, we realized that as much as we tried to simplify the data and what it's trying to measure or communicate, we still needed to contextualize the data and provide a narrative that's easy to follow um, and also allow us to communicate all aspects of the story that the data set is trying to tell at the same time. So our, our team instantly started using ArcGIS story maps, not only to amplify the data visualization uh, we had been working on, but also to highlight details like why the data is important, how it's being used, and what steps our users can take in order to get involved and integrate the data into, the own, into their own work. So the story maps tool became um, essential to the work that we were doing uh, because it was data-driven, it was GIS driven, it was interactive, um, and it also allowed us to embed multimedia content. Um, so, we also had the opportunity to learn a lot uh, about um, story maps through the uh, 2020 ArcGIS story map competition uh, that we co-organized with our colleagues at ESRI last year. Uh, we received submissions from uh, different countries about uh, all the SDGs and it was really a pleasure to go through the stories and 
learn about the amazing projects that were being done um, around the world. Uh, I know my, my colleagues from Azure are going to go into a lot more detail about story maps on the competition this year, so I, I won't um, talk about that too much, but I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a number of story map collections for you to explore on the Eco Ambassadors page um, and uh, on our website. And we also have a storytelling page um, on the SDGs Today platform where you can find uh, story maps by SDGs, um, data sets related to your project and, and other resources that might uh, benefit um, your, your final project this year. Thank you, Tara. Thank you so much, Mariam. That is very helpful. And we'll, we'll uh, share some of those links in the chat and at the end again. Um, and thank you for being such a great partner in this program. Um, so before we get started, just to go over a bit about our summer program goals and the timeline and activities. So uh, we're already in July. So we're here at Storytelling Workshop using Story Maps. Um, that's today. Uh, and I'll give a bit of a recap on the workshops we've had so far after this. Um, so after today's workshop, uh, we'll be asking you to continue practicing with the learn path that we have where there's modules um, that cover the same skills that we've been doing in these live workshops. Again, we'll share that link in the chat. That's a great resource for you to use on your own time to keep practicing these skills. And then based on the topics that you've submitted before, or, or if you still have to submit a topic, or even if your topic evolves as you learn more information, we want you to start playing with the tools and start putting together some draft story maps. Um, and then we'll plan to share those at a workshop in August, which we'll share that date soon. Um, but it'll be sometime around mid-August that we'll have a, a live session where we'll ask you, the participants, the Eco Ambassadors, to share what you've been working on so far. And that'll be an opportunity for all of us to to give feedback, bounce ideas around, and, and support each other on that. Um, and then next week on the 22nd, we're planning an office hours session. So for any of you who have started using ArcGIS online, or after this session, once you start using Story Maps, and you have any questions or any technical issues that you want some help with, that office hours session will be a chance to just log on. We'll have some experts from Esri who can help answer some of your questions. So we'll uh, share more information about that as a follow-up to this workshop and send the, the Zoom link for that the day before that session. And again, that'll be on the 22nd. Um, August, we'll have our, our uh, draft sharing session and then the final story maps will be due around the end of August and we'll prepare to share some of those during uh, a session during the International Conference on Sustainable Development in September. So just to recap a bit, um, a workshop we had a little over a month ago on June 5th was focused on uh, SDG 14 resources. What resources are already out there where you can find information about different sustainable development challenges relating to the oceans and, and our waterways and uh, different data sets that are out there that you can use to, to plug into ArcGIS online and to, to help you create maps and explore different issues. And so for any of you who were unable to join that session, all of our sessions are on our YouTube channel. And you can also check out our blog on our ed4sds.org site where we have those resources linked there. And those include some of the resources Marianne mentioned from SDGs today. Um, and we'll share that link in the chat. Um, and then on the 25th, we had our uh, workshop on getting started with ArcGIS online, where we had some expert, experts from SDGs Today and from Esri go through some demonstrations for us and show us all the amazing tools and data sets that are in there and how we can layer them to explore different uh, issues and possible research questions to, to guide our work. So again, all of these are on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash ed4sd. We'll share that in the chat. Um, and so far, uh, many of you have already submitted your topics and we've put those into a map. And so you can see that we have representation in many parts of the world, which is very exciting to see where all of you are conducting your research this summer. Um, and of course, we want to see more dots on this map. So any of you who have not yet submitted your research topic, please do so because once you submit that, then we will send you your free ESRI license to help you get set up with that. Um, so that's just another reminder on that. Um, uh, it's okay if you don't know exactly what you want to study yet or if it might evolve, just send us the topic submission with what you're thinking about so we can get you set up because we want you to get set up as soon as possible so you can get started with all these great ArcGIS online tools. 
Okay. So our first discussion today, we have um, some speakers with us and they are going to talk to us a bit about what we need for effective storytelling. What are some techniques? What are some tools? What are some tips to help us tell compelling stories that are gonna make people listen to these important issues and feel compelled to take action? We have uh, Brighton Kaoma. He's the global director for the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the youth uh, program. He holds a master's in public administration uh, with a focus in environmental science and policy from Columbia University. So he started as a 14 year old trailblazer, a climate activist and a radio broadcaster in his home country of Zambia, where he was recognized by some of the world's greatest thought leaders, including uh, our former president Barack Obama, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, Prince Harry, and was awarded in 2015 the inaugural Queen's Young Leaders Award. Um, and he's worked with World Wildlife Fund for Nature and he served in uh, many different uh, portfolios and corporate sustainability across many continents. So we're so happy to have Brighton with us today. Um, and Radhika, do we have Andy with us? He's not here yet, uh, but maybe okay. join a little later. Okay, so we'll go ahead and Brighton, we're gonna, we're gonna ask you a couple questions um, and just yeah. uh, go from there. So I'm gonna stop sharing for now so we can all see Brighton. Um, That's good, and thank you, Tara. Very excited <laughs> to be here this morning. Yeah, so maybe if you can just get us started and, and tell us a little bit about your background and what got you interested in storytelling and why you see storytelling as such an effective tool for inspiring action. Um, th that's a very important question, and, and I'm very excited to see um, 40 of us here meeting to discuss pathways through which we can tell more compelling stories. And when I think about this topic, uh, it, it takes me back 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, when I was growing up in a very small mining town on the Copper Belt province of Zambia. And while growing up, I observed that there were moments where children were being prevented from attending classes consistently because of bridges being washed away by the floods. There were moments where children would breathe in the air that they could actually see because of the sulfur dioxide that was emitted in the atmosphere. There were also moments where the main source of water clean drinking water would be polluted because of um, sulfuric acid that might end up being disposed in these water bodies. So being raised in such an environment and observing the challenges that were being imposed on the environment made me start thinking about ways through which we could, number one, educate the community. Because I realized that education is so powerful. It empowers you with the knowledge and the competencies and the skills to make the right choices. So I thought, what is the best medium to raise awareness and mobilize young people to take action for these challenges that I'm seeing? So then when I was about 14 in my teenage years, I went to the radio station near where I was living. You might ask why radio? So radio in Zambia and most African countries remains as one of the most trusted, inexpensive medium of information. So whenever you want to hear what time it is, you turn the radio on. Whenever you want to hear what the weather is, you turn the radio on. So it acts as a reservoir and outlet of so much knowledge and information. And the communities trust the medium of radio as a conduit for accurate, reliable, and trusted information. It's very you know, synonymous to many trusted um, sources of information in the US and other parts of the world. So I started running a radio show uh, at around 14. And my model was, how can we allow communities themselves to tell more compelling stories? But not only compelling stories, but more authentic stories. So then would bring in children from communities who were being affected directly by the impacts of the changing climate, would bring in women that could no longer grow their vegetables in their backyards to sustain their families because the land is impoverished, but also would bring in the local authority responsible for enforcing legislation 
and would engage in a face-to-face -face with the community in a more dialogue uh, format. So this journey taught me one thing, and this is something that I would want to equally emphasize as part of these nuggets about effective storytelling. Every community, wherever you may be, there might be challenges around it. But what's important is for you to start identifying what those challenges may be or what those opportunities may be. If it's opportunities and solutions for SDGs, how can you speak about them and replicate and raise their profile? If it's challenges, how can you begin to identify those challenges? And while doing that, how do you keep focus on your audience? So in my case, my audience was the community. I was speaking on radio and bringing people together so that the community could be enlightened. And for them to be enlightened, what would be the next step after they have this knowledge? So the next step was them taking action, mobilizing, planting trees, um, speaking against indiscriminate disposal of waste from the big copper mines. So the audience, after some years, started having that strong age and passion to take action because they knew that if the water is polluted, it's also going to be affected. They knew that if the land is impoverished, it's also being affected because we cannot be able to grow crops to sustain our families. So the focus was on the audience, and that meant putting the audience's needs and preferences first. What is it about your story that would be meaningful to them as an audience? And after all, the reason you're telling the story is because you want to get something across. Then what's the structure of the story that you're trying to tell? Because you want the story to flow. And one way to do that is to ask yourself the key questions. Like, what is the story that I'm trying to communicate? Who is being affected? How will I tell it? I'll use ArcGIS and what format will make it more coherent? When will I tell it? And why am I telling it? So when you answer those key critical questions, they help you form a clearer structure. And fairy tales are a great example of classically structured stories, Tara. They begin with once upon a time, they introduce you to the person who the story is going to be about. Uh, they introduce the conflicts. Um, and finally, fairy tales describe how the problem was overcome. So how do you follow a similar structure to describe the different layers to your stories? But also sometimes it's important to include the facts in this context. For example, like I indicated earlier, every storyteller, and you might think you're not good at storytelling, everybody has got unique stories. They're unique stories and the way I can tell them is different from how Radhika will tell these stories or how Mariam will tell these stories. So all of us, just like the way we have unique fingerprints, have unique ways of telling our stories. And you shouldn't think you're not a good storyteller. Everybody's a good storyteller. All it requires is for you to practice or it requires is for you to follow this structure. Just like any seasoned journalist, for example, they answer five essential questions every time they're writing a story. They answer, who is the story targeting? What is the story about? Where did this story take place? When did it take place? And why is this story important? So that's a structure that could be replicated, even if it's a story you're writing, it's a story that you are, you are telling, or it's a story that you are recording on video. So I'll end here and take it back to you, Tarai, for any questions. Thank you, thank you. I like that. I think of that like a, a party invitation format, the who, yeah. what, when, where, and why. That's that's great. And I love this, the, um, the fairy tale, you know, thinking of it like that, that arc of the story, you know. Um, and I think focusing on the audience too, who are you trying to compel with your story is such a key, key tip. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to ask a couple other questions if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. 
So, so when you're coming up with a story, especially on these issues related to sustainable development and the SDGs, um, it might be hard to figure out where to begin, right? Because if we think about some of the roots of many of these challenges, we could go far, far, far back. There's so many things to talk about. So do you have any tips um, to kind of help people think, where can I start or how can I kind of zero in on the issue that I want to tell a story about? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the issues we are addressing are quite complex, but I think what's more important than anything, Tara, is to simplify it. What makes a story even more unique and relevant is not to think about rocket science ideas and rocket science thoughts about how this story is going to be structured. For example, if you're thinking about a problem around, say, climate action, or you're thinking about what's happening to uh, plastics in the water bodies. Think about local challenges that you are facing, for example. Are there any streams around you that are being uh, polluted and not being cared for accordingly? And how can you tell a story from that local problem while thinking about local challenges? So I, I would say think locally and act globally. Think globally and act locally, <laughs> vice versa. So as, as you are in your community, how do you begin to think about all these complex global problems and then filter them down to your community? Because that's the only way and place where you can take action or tell your story because it's relatable to you. It's something that you interact with. It's something that you see. It's something that you've heard about. But also there might be situations where you know a challenge and it was told to you by somebody so number one is how do you gather the necessary evidence the evidence that can help you have concrete examples and facts and, and and figures for example in your story structure so for example in this case it could be starting by talking to somebody somebody that might told, uh, might have told you a story about the challenges they are faced with in their, in their community and begin to now ask those key questions. Why is this problem important? Who does it affect? When does it affect them? For how long has, has it affected them? Are there any local actions being done to address this challenge? And then you use that to now create a more coherent story of that specific challenge. Um, the other example that I would want to give, and it's related more to SDG number one and number two. And it's in form of a story that was told in an interesting TED talk that I watched. But also this story is written in a book called Ripples from the Zambezi. You can look it up and see some of the different nuggets and other stories were told in this book. So there were a team of experts that went to Southern Zambia. And I want you to imagine a very vast valley which is inundated with water seasonally and communities there are engaged in fishing and they benefit from the proteins and they benefit from the nutrients, but also they benefit from the trade of, of dried fish or fresh fish. So a team of experts did some research, um, online research, and they decided to go to Zambia. They arrived in this very small community, a green community where people would grow the food that they used to eat. But when they arrived, they were amazed at the expansiveness of these plains, the valleys, and they were looking extremely horrible for grain crops. And their intention was to grow tomatoes. So they arrived, they found a piece of land and they said, we're going to grow tomatoes. They realized that when they were experimenting and they started clearing the land and they planted the tomatoes, tomatoes in this particular community would grow this size. Elsewhere, they would grow this size. And they were extremely amazed to the extent to which the land was so fertile and how there was enough water uh, because we had planted these tomatoes very close to a river. 
along the banks of the river. But from time to time, they would speak to the local community and ask why the local community were not participating. Sometimes they would even reach an extent of paying the local community to participate, but majority of them would not show up. Maybe a couple would show up when they had invited 60 people. So the day before harvesting the tomatoes, they went with all their barrels. They were very excited. And they said, today is harvest day and we're going to collect all these tomatoes. Then at five in the morning, they had started off, they got there around eight in the morning. And the moment they arrived, they saw a plain field with no tomatoes. Then they asked the local communities, what happened to the tomatoes that were growing extremely large? Then the, the, the local community said, well, you were asleep. The hippos came in from the nearby river and hit all the tomatoes. They had a feast. <laughs> yeah, they had a feast on all the tomatoes and the local communities said, that's the reason why we don't plant tomatoes here. We have done this before. We understand the problem. We understand what causes the problem and we know the solution. That's the reason why we grow rice because we know that no hippos are going to come in and consume our rice. So this story to me reminds me about certain key things. It's about evidence. How do you, on top of researching the evidence, how do you equally find people that you can speak to, that you can consult, that you can engage in conversation with to get the evidence that is necessary in constructing your story. But when you also think about the story that I just told, there is a specific problem, what the problem is, why this problem is important, and when this problem existed. And the solution in this case is always ask questions, always speak to people, don't think you have all the knowledge and the wisdom in the world because learning is a lifelong process. And when you're telling your story in this context, it's important to find individuals, to find sources of evidence, sources of information that can make the story you're telling even more concrete. That's such a great story. And I think, you know, it that lesson of listening and kind of being willing to, to evolve as you go, as you bring in more information is so relevant to this project that we're doing, right? And kind of what I mentioned earlier about the topic submission, we might have an idea of what we want to research, but once we get in there and start making maps and adding layers and seeing what other data is there, it can lead us down another path. And then um, our research may take, take a, a slightly different shape and that's okay because that's part of the process. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think maybe maybe one more question I wanted to ask you about is, you know, in this case, we really are trying to tell stories to inspire action, right? We want to in inspire people to want to get involved in these issues and to help address them. So do you have any tips for strong calls to action and how we might infuse those into our, our story maps that we'll be working on? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think that's, that's the essence of telling stories, Tara. Um, when you have the audience in mind, then that will help you understand what are they interested in? And what sort of information can I tell in my story that is going to make them want to take action? It, does this affect them directly? If it affects them directly, in what ways? Sometimes people might be affected by challenges without even realizing. So, it's important to have your audience at the back of your mind, but then how do you conclude these stories that you are telling becomes even more and more important. And I think that's where solutions come in. I think at the end of your story, how do you begin to give recommendations? It could be practical examples of how that particular challenge was solved elsewhere. It could be practical references to different examples of how that particular situation was addressed. But it also might include providing tips, tips around how young people, for example, can take action individually, how communities can take action. And 
it's about providing those nuggets of tips to take action that even make your entire story even more stronger and concrete because then you're giving people the tools to say you don't have to be big to start but you have to start to be big you can mobilize people in your community beginning with your household tell them about these challenges go into the community mobilize young people in schools in communities organize virtual events uh think about cleanup events provide people with those nuggets of practical things that they can do because when they even think about the complexity of for example plastic pollution and how it affects aquatic species uh, how for example pollution might affect animals when they consume them it looks extremely complex and people might feel suffocated to do anything so providing suggestions of practical things that an individual can do themselves what the community can do what the local city can do allows you to even have a much stronger story because it's real it's practical it's not rocket science but it's something that people can do within their means and it also provides them with steps on how they can engage different stakeholders how they can engage their families how can they engage their schools how they can engage their local municipality how they can engage their governments and then it goes it goes upwards so um, i find it very very helpful to provide those guide rails around what individuals can do what people can do and practical steps of what action would look like I love that. So my big takeaways is keep try to keep it simple, connect to the big issues, the big stories, the big solutions, but then how do you bring that down to something very simple that people can relate to their lives and and see how they can take that action in their in their realm of influence. Um, it just reminds me, I, I was a community organizer before working at Columbia and we had what we called the campaign story hourglass where it's kind of like that visual of big problem. But how do we connect that down to something specific in our community that we can do? What's that specific simple action? But then how does my small action have that ripple effect to, to bring that big solution to, to reality? So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we really appreciate your insights. And I think we all are feeling more motivated to tell some very compelling stories. So thank you, Brighton, for being with us today. Excellent. Very, very excited. And uh, it looks like uh, everybody's working on very interesting and fascinating ideas. Um, don't be afraid to start whatever you have. Think about taking those steps. Uh, your story might take a shift or it might take a turn. But what really matters is starting. Right, I like that. What did you say? You you don't have to be big to start, but you have to start to be big. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Brighton. I'm going to go ahead and bring my screen back up. So. We have some uh, wonderful speakers with us today who are going to, um, speakers from Esri who are going to walk us through uh, how to use story maps. But before we introduce them, I just want to show a quick introductory video about story maps. Um, and this again is part of the learn path that we'll share the link to in the chat where you can find all of the modules. So I'm going to go ahead and, and play this video. Maps have always told stories. They've just never done so quite like this. If you have a story to tell, and where it takes place is a big part of the story. ArcGIS Story Maps is the way to tell it. Now, it's reimagined, redesigned, and rebuilt from the ground up. You can make a story map in minutes. No matter your digital skill set, you can edit fast or thoroughly customize. You can do it all yourself or work in a team. Share and publish and make your mark on the world. Every story has a place and every place has a story. Make yours count. Great. That was exciting. I'm excited. Um, so now to help us get a little more familiar with the ArcGIS Story Maps platform, we have two great speakers with us today. Uh, Ross Donahue is a cartographer and product engineer from Esri's Story Maps team. 
and Ross uses place-based storytelling to engage users through beautiful, informative, and inspiring cartography. So Ross is going to first uh, tell us a little more about Story Maps, some of its features, and some of the ways we can use it. And then uh, after Ross gives us that intro, we have Liz Todd with us as well, who is a multimedia specialist and product engineer with Esri Story Maps team. And Liz uses place-based storytelling to elevate and empower voices with a focus on leveraging GIS for equity and social justice. And Liz will take us through a demonstration of how we can create our own story maps. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Ross. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's just so exciting to be here. Brighton, your storytelling tips were on point, And it's just really inspiring to be part of this conversation with you all today. Um, so like Tara mentioned, my name is Ross Donahue. I've been with Esri for about three years now, and I do anything from develop uh, partnerships with organizations to help folks get started using ArcGIS story maps through webinars, through instructional blogs, and through example stories. And so what I'm going to be talking about is how do you apply those great storytelling techniques that Brighton mentioned to the tool of ArcGIS story maps. Now, just to get started, you know, Esri has all of these different mapping tools. They have this thing called ArcGIS, um, and this is Esri's cloud mapping um, ecosystem, which has a lot of different tools that are uh, that all work together and allow you to do anything from storytelling to analysis. And you can even create surveys and engage your audience through a number of tools. You know, what we'll be talking about today is one of those tools called ArcGIS Story Maps. And it's a web-based tool that allows you to tell stories using maps, multimedia content, and text. And you can really uh, customize it and tell stories um, that are local or global, and uh, they allow you to tell stories about the world. And as you think about your projects and think about how you tell your story and how you apply these techniques that Brighton described, um, it's important to consider you know, who your audience is and what that purpose is behind your story. What's the action you want your uh, folks to take? So you know, throughout my presentation, I'm going to just be reinforcing a lot of those things that Brighton mentioned. Sorry for the helicopter. I'm in Washington, DC. <laughs> um, and talk a little bit more about place-based storytelling and how it can apply to your projects. Now, you know, like Brighton mentioned, um, before you even start using the tools, it's important to start asking questions around what your project's going to uh, be about, you know, that who, what, when, why, where, how uh, of storytelling. And so before you even start using the builder uh, that Liz will be demoing, um, it's important to just jot down some notes. You know, who is your core audience? What is your story and why is it important? And this will help save time as you are, you know, assembling your content, collecting content in the field. Um, I would also really drive home this idea of place-based storytelling. What is a story that sparks your curiosity that's local, like Brighton said, but has a global relevancy? Those stories will be more compelling because they'll be rooted in your individual context as opposed to a place that's far away. Now, SDG 14 is a really big big um, goal and it's uh, so much is encompassed within this topic. And so, it, you know, it's really overwhelming when you start thinking about how do I tell a story about that encompasses all of this. But in actuality, you know, you can relate the oceans to so many different stories and factors, whether it's, you know, as simple as um, marine plastics on a beach to um, you know, fisheries in your, in your local context. One recent uh, story I wanna share is working with a user in Sri Lanka who uh, studies ocean uh, related uh, phenomena. And she approached our team and said, hey, there's this marine disaster that's happening. 
where nurdles are being washed up on the beach. The first thing I did was I Googled what nurdles are because I didn't know. And if you don't know, they're small uh, pieces of plastic that are used to create larger pieces of plastic. Um, and this ship went down and all of these nurdles were washing up on the beach. And so this is an example of a very localized um, story that they wanted to tell and drive people to action of uh, collecting points and reporting where these nurdles were rolling up on the beach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and show you a couple uh, story examples to talk about, you know, really drive home what um, ArcGIS story maps is and what you can do with them in this context. Okay, so is everybody seeing my screen? I think so. Yeah, yeah we can see it, Klaus. Awesome. So this is a story that um, our team collaborated with Old Dominion University uh, and NOAA to tell, tell a story about coastal flooding. Now, what you're seeing right now is a finished story. Um, and immediately, I want to just draw your attention to some of the key elements and uh, walk you through the story, talking about storytelling techniques that we used, but also uh, some of the different functionalities that might spur some ideas for you as you craft your story. So early on in this process, we were thinking about, you know, who is the audience and what's the purpose of the story? Now, the primary audience are coastal communities, particularly in the US that are experiencing sea level rise and coastal flooding. NOAA told us, you know, something that, they're, that they try to do all the time is talk about this idea of coastal flooding. And most people think of it as just a one-time event, but in actuality, every time there's a high tide in certain communities, there's a scene that looks like this. And because of sea level rise, this will happen more and more on the annual, on the daily cycle of you know, high tide and low tide. Oftentimes we think coastal flooding is only tied to extreme events, but actually high tide flooding events are much more common and are becoming a real uh, problem in a lot of communities. Now, like Brighton said, thinking locally and then acting globally is exactly the approach we took here because we focused on one specific location, Norfolk, Virginia, where they are experiencing this high tide flooding events um, frequently. And so as you can see with ArcGIS story maps, you know, this is just a website where you can go and explore and read about coastal flooding and combine, you know, text and rich multimedia really easily. But you can also use things like quotes and, and style these to really draw your reader's attention to um, these kind of more official or authoritative sources of information. And so like Brighton said, being able to talk with people, interview them, ask questions, you can incorporate those responses into your story in the form of this quote block. And it will add uh, validity and uh, more truthfulness to your storytelling. It'll keep your readers engaged and have them uh, trust your, your story more and more by bringing in that expert knowledge. Now, one of the really exciting features of ArcGIS story maps is the ability to have these kind of basic blocks that allow you to add, you know, photos, videos, text, all in line, but we also have immersive blocks. I love immersive blocks because they create this uh, engaging reading experience without needing to code or to take a lot of time sort of to develop. You can experiment. And so this immersive block, it's called Map Tour. And what happens is as I scroll, you can see we've got a locator map here, image here, and description here. And what's cool about this is, you know, folks can zoom around on the map, they can read, 
And they can move through this topic uh, relatively quickly, but it's more engaging and keeps your reader's attention. We also have these navigation bars that allow us to jump to different sections within a story. This is helpful for you know, stories that perhaps have uh, that sort of beginning, middle, and end structure, or say you want to jump to a specific uh, topic of interest. Now, of course, my favorite part of story maps is the maps. Being able to incorporate these dynamic and interactive maps really quickly allows for, for a very engaging experience. Um, and you can incorporate this information really, really easily by using uh, a variety of Esri tools that are built right into the builder. Now, this map is showing global sea level rise at a variety of um, points around the world. And you can see that you know, sea level rise is affecting different local communities very differently. In some places, like here in the Gulf uh, Coast, there's extreme sea level rise. And in other places, you know, there's actually a decrease in the sea level. And so I think the real point of this visual is to show that different communities are being affected, affected in different ways. And so having that local context is really important to driving home this information. We incorporated some charts as well as some uh, reports. And here we see another really uh, powerful feature, which is the, the swipe, um, swipe block, which allows you to have either two images or two maps side by side. And here we see sea level rise um, scenarios in Norfolk. So the places in blue uh, show uh, how, which areas will ex experience flooding. Um, and you can see some of these spots, particularly here in this uh, kind of shipping area, are going to experience at least high, high, high flooding um, events in the future. Another block that we love to use is this immersive block called Sidecar, where you can scroll on the map and create these visually rich experiences where data will change on the map, as well as um, you can change the, the actual view of the map itself with something we like to call map choreography. So here you're in the city of Norfolk, and you can zoom out to the whole region. And then we've incorporated another interactive feature called Map Actions. Map Actions allow you to have a button that zooms to a specific part of your map. So this provides, again, that local context for a global issue of sea level rise. Now, as we think about these big topics in creating the story, it was really important to not overcomplicate the story. There's so many different you know, areas we could have gone with this story, um, but we didn't wanna overwhelm our readers. We wanted to keep it simple and to the point and demonstrate these case studies while also making it relevant to other coastal communities to think about coastal resilience adaptation, and how we sort of live with this reality um, and make adjustments um, and motivate people to action. So in terms of our call to action here, we really wanted to show resources that other coastal communities could use to inform how they create resilient communities in their own backyard. So we have this sea level rise viewer, we have this um, the NOAA Tides and Currents resource, inundation charts, and other resources that can be used to recreate the same uh, story and analysis that was done here. Now, I just want to reiterate how this is a place-based story. 
So it uses the local context and the characteristics of that specific lo location to tell a larger story. And it uses a variety of blocks from text blocks, quote blocks, immersive blocks, and things like the slider and um, other elements. One other thing to consider is how you create a cohesive story that, that looks uniform throughout. So here we have this nice blue uh, background color and some other accent colors. Now that blue is tied directly to uh, the topic of the story. So the topic of the story is about oceans and about uh, these water events. And so we chose to use a blue color scheme to sort of evoke that sense for the reader as they go through it. We also added uh, charts that fit with this background as opposed to looking visually completely different. In doing so, it creates a more polished story and a story that your readers will stay engaged with and, and be more interested in, uh, in doing that. And after reading, we created this call to action. And so I, we see a lot of stories that forget to include a call to action. And that's a missed opportunity because like Brighton said, the whole reason for telling the story is to to communicate an important, the importance behind it and, and what we can do. And so, you know, it's really important to always consider what your call to action will be. And that can be as simple as, you know, signing a petition or submitting information or um, just be, just continuing to learn about a topic even. And you could link back to the SDG 14, you know, website or page. Um, like like this one here. I'll show one more example and then I know everybody wants to see how do you make one of these things. And so I'll turn it over to Liz after that. So this is a story about uh, tropical cyclones. Now cyclones, again, very big topic, but we can root it in place and we can root it in some of the very most important or most interesting facts about them. And so, you know, we broke this up into some basic information about what cyclones are, how they're impacting humans. We call out some of the exceptional storms, some of the largest, most, uh, you know, most impactful. But we also focus on what not just human impact, but also the ecosystem impact and then have a call to action and uh, a way to get involved. Okay, so again, you know, we'll provide these stories in the chat, but um, there's lots of different ways to tell stories as these examples show, but there are these common elements between all of them. The last thing I wanna show is another feature within uh, ArcGIS Story Maps, which is called collections. Now, collections are a way to combine multiple stories into one place and package them up into a resource for your audience. Oftentimes, we're, we start making a story and it and it starts getting really long and it's you know it's going to be like a twenty minute reading experience. Now, in terms of you know digital content you're going to lose your audience really quickly if you have a super long story that people have to scroll, scroll, scroll. And so it can oftentimes be better to break that up into individual sections, whether it's, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, or, you know, what is it? Why is it important? How do I take action? And you can create an individual story and put them into a collection. And that's much more approachable for a lay audience than just having one massive story that tries to do it all. So that's where collections comes in. Now this is a collection that um, my colleagues put together of uh, 50 inspiring stories about ocean exploration, marine wildlife and habitat. Again, we'll share this link. Um, but you know, with the collection, they're really easy to create. 
And for a reader, you just click get started. And you can start reading that first story. And once you're done, you can jump to your next story. And we're seeing a lot of folks start using this pattern more and more as they can customize it. And I think about how they sort of create this, this package of story content. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Liz uh, to share how do you actually assemble a story and uh, get started. Um, so Thanks thank so much, Ross. All right, everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. My name is Liz Todd. I'm a multimedia specialist on Esri Story Maps team, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about getting started with ArcGIS Story Maps. So right now you should be seeing our product homepage here you have a really nice overview of what Story Maps is. You can go ahead and explore the stories. So as a team, we uh, curate content. We highlight some really incredible work that folks in the community are doing. And we even create albums by topic. So if you're looking for a specific thing, you can find it. We also have a resources page. So this is where you can check up on all the things that we're creating as a team. Most of us create some blog posts, webinars, et cetera. And there are also some handy tips on how to start building your story right on this website. This website is also where you can launch the builder. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this blue launch the ArcGIS Story Maps Builder button. And because I've already logged in, it's gonna jump me directly into my, my, uh, my stories page. As you can see, I have a little bit of content in here already. Um, and the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that right off the bat, I can tell the state my story is in. So I have a story here about, you know, SDG 13 that's already published and you have that really nice uh, turquoise published marker by there so that I can see, you know, exactly where it's at. I have another story about storytelling uh, that's in draft format. And then I have a story about shade equity in LA which is published out to the world, but has some unpublished changes. It's actually one of my favorite things about ArcGIS Story Maps is I can make a story public and then I can go into the back end and edit if I need to update something consistently and then just make those uh, changes live when I need them to. This page is also where I can go ahead and start a new story. So if I click this turquoise new story button, I have the option to start from scratch or I can use one of our quick start options that use pre-configured templates that involve uh, specific immersive blocks like Sidecar, Guided Map Tour, or even Explorer Map Tour. And so if you already have a little bit of an idea of where you wanna go with your story, these templates are for you. Um, but in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and click start from scratch and we're gonna jump right into the builder. So now you're seeing the, the ArcGIS Story Maps Builder you get this really nice prompt to title your story. I'm really creative, so I guess I'm gonna title this. This is a demo, um, very, very creative. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add in an image. I have a whole folder of multimedia that I prepared for this. And I think I wanna use an iceberg um, as, my, as my cover photo. Um, but right now I don't necessarily love how this is displaying. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the design. When you wanna change the cover of your story, you have three different options. You have this minimalist option, which we're viewing now. You have a side-by-side -side option, and then you have a full option. And the full option is what I, what I really love, um, especially if you have really immersive media. And so I'm gonna go ahead and see if I like you know, my title on the lower part of it. It actually covers up the iceberg. So I'm gonna move it back up into the sky, which is a little stormy looking and leave it there. I also think I might wanna change the theme of this story. You know, this is one of our, if you open up the design panel, you can see we have six pre-configured themes and these themes are all optimized for accessible storytelling, meaning they all have accessible texts and fonts and color contrasts. And you also have the option to build your own theme. So I'm gonna go into my themes right now and I'm gonna go ahead and apply a theme called Antarctica. Um, but for example, when you open up Theme Builder and you wanna build your own theme, 
you can go ahead and change the background color. So I've made the background color this kind of light blue. Uh, I've set an accent color as a turquoise. And then I've gone ahead and picked out some typography. We have the option to add fonts directly from the Google font library if you wanted, but in this case, I've just gone with a font that we offer up right in Builder. I also have the option to change, you know, any kind of buttons and button formation. In this case, I went with kind of a, a middle rectangular button. And I can also change things like my quote style um, and change how it's centered or my linking style, right? How I want my links to look. And I can even upload a custom separator or just change the separator style in general. And lastly, I can upload a logo directly to this page and even add alt text for that logo to ensure that that logo is accessible to folks using assistive technologies like screen readers. So I'm gonna go back to my themes and I'm gonna go ahead and select my Antarctica theme again uh, and jump back into my demo, browse my themes. There we go. And now we automatically have my theme in our story. And so as you can see, we now have this nice light blue background um, and I can open up the block palette and add anything from our, our building blocks. Um, instead of doing that in this story though, I'm actually gonna jump into a story that I pre-made that will give us a little bit more time, um, that will give us a little bit uh, more, more background and enable us to go through all the different features slightly more quickly. Um, so I've gone ahead and recreated that demo that we just built. I gave it a slightly better title. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and show you everything there is to know about the builder. So the builder allows you to create flexible pages um, with no coding. And while that might seem overwhelming at first because we have a lot of options in the block palette, I'm going to show you just how easy it is to get started with story maps today. So the first thing I wanna do is add some text. Again, I'm creative, so you know, this is some text and maybe I wanna change things about that text. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight it and the rich text editor has just popped up. I have the option to change the format of that text. I can turn it into a heading. Um, I can turn it into a subheading if I want. In this case, I'm just going to leave it as paragraph text. If I highlight it again, I have the option to bold it or italicize it, and I can even change the color. So if you remember in that theme builder where I pointed out different accent colors, I could change that text to maybe a light turquoise to match my, my main accents. Um, I also have the option to add really beautiful functions like quote blocks, so you know this, a quote, a very quotable quote. It's so quotable, in fact, I think I'm gonna call it out. And so now we have a delightful quote and a quote block. You wanna use quote box to draw your audience's attention to main points in your story. And so you can do this a couple of different ways, but if you have like a, an expert, a subject matter expert, you wanna quote in one of these quote blocks, or you just wanna call attention to part of your copy, um, you can put that copy in a paragraph format and then later on call it out in a quote block to hammer that point home. And quotes are also a really great visual separator for your readers. Um, that way they get some extra negative space in your story and visually there's not such a wall of text or just a bunch of different immersives. The next thing I wanna talk to you about today is graphics. So we have these really awesome graphic options. The first is a button. So you can go ahead and use buttons to talk about um, different websites or things you wanna link to. I use buttons usually at the end of stories for call to action. So this is a call to action, it's very inspiring. And I can go ahead and link something like some more base maps about Antarctica if I wanted to here. Um, and I can also use that button to to call attention or maybe have folks expand something in a larger window. I would say that usually calls to actions and buttons are done best or used best towards the end of stories. Um, they're the kind of thing that are pretty bold and so they may draw your audience out of your story and you wanna kind of keep them reading, right? You wanna keep them in your story, keep it sticky. Uh, so you don't always want to have a lot of buttons, use them sparingly. And if you're just looking to, um, if you're just looking to link more information, um, you can even just highlight that text, 
like I said before, open up the rich text editor and link it instead. So I can do the same thing there. And now instead of pulling somebody out of the builder, we're just going to say, hey, you know, visual prompt that there's a link here with more information. I can also go ahead and add separators. So this right here is a separator. I can drag it and move it around. But separators are a really, really great visual indicator for, for audiences that, you know, a section is ending. So in this case, I have um, my story, my demo story separated out into different blocks and different portions. So we're in kind of the more introductory part of, of the story maps builder at the moment, text, graphics, multimedia. Um, but as we move forward, you'll see separators delineating different areas within my story. Um, so make really, really great use of separators when you need them. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is multimedia. So what's really great about stories is that you can add things like video, you can add images, you can add maps, you can add audio. And these are all the types of options that augment your storytelling. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna throw in an image of some penguins. So I, I went on a trip a couple of years ago to Antarctica and I figured, you know, what better theme than Antarctica and maybe some marine life um, to highlight for this demo. So I've just added in a picture of some penguins. Um, this is a really great way to, to show some intangible options. And, you know, Hannah Wilbur on our Story Maps team has created an incredible blog post about incorporating imagery into stories. I can float this image to the left. I can make it small in the middle. I can expand it super big, right? It all depends on what I'm using the image for and if I want to um, call more or less attention to it. I also can add alt text here. I will say whenever you add in an image, make sure you add an alt text. Ultimately, this is what makes your story accessible and we wanna be building accessible stories. Um, another form of multimedia that I mentioned is audio. This is a really incredible way to use um, kind of another sense. So if you want your, your, your audience to understand more about penguins, in this case, Penguins are super loud, but you don't always know that, right? So a lot of times they look really calm and cute and um, I guess quieter uh, in, in uh, images that we see. But if you've ever been to a penguin rookery, they are overwhelmingly noisy. And so I can go ahead and then add different audio, maybe audio of a penguin like I did here. Uh, and I can also choose how that audio displays as well. One of the, the great things about story maps and you know it's in the name, it's maps, right? So how do you geospatially kind of tell your story? How do you augment your narrative? In this case, you have a couple of different options. You can go ahead and add a map and you have the option to add it from your content. You can add it from your organization. You can even go into Living Atlas and look for and, and sort through thousands of authoritative data layers. There's a lot of information out there about the ocean. And I can also go in and add an express map, which means I can just create an express map right in my story. And these are incredible because they don't require you to have a bunch of cartographic skills. They don't require you to have a bunch of data. Um, they just mean that you can build a map with points and lines and for all those cartography nerds out there, even arrows right in your story. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a point because I wanna tell you more about my, my journey. So I started my journey in Ushuaia in Tierra del Fuego. I'm gonna go ahead and add it to the map. I can add an image here. So let's talk about, you know, maybe a sea lion. This is a sea lion friend that I had um, right there. And then I can go ahead and drop a point on the map. You know, we went over to the Antarctic Peninsula. And so I can go in and add an image of, you know, the peninsula here. And then, I don't want people to think that I just like miraculously, you know, jumped from one point to the other. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a path. So I'm gonna draw a line from the tip of South America to the Antarctic Peninsula. And, you know, I didn't go through those islands. I went around them, My, a boat didn't just kind of like come out of the ocean, go over an island and go back into it. Um, so I'm gonna bend it around that island. And then I'm gonna let people know that this is my path. 
So I'm going to drop in an annotation and go my path. And then all of a sudden my audience is aware, you know, this is the journey I took to get to, to Antarctica, to the Antarctic Peninsula. And in a matter of honestly, probably close to a minute, maybe two, I've created a really beautiful map. I've given some context to my story. And now my reader knows a little bit more about what, what I did there. So I mentioned earlier, you could use, you know, some of our graphics to, um, to call attention to things. You can also embed content. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste in that same Antarctic base map layer. Um, I have the option to either do it immersive in an interactive view, or I can go ahead and display this content as a card. In this case, this feature is, is much better as a card. It's kind of overwhelming as an interactive embed. But now if folks wanted to learn more about the Antarctic base map layers that have been created and are out there in the world, they could click this card for, for more information. I also want to get into some of our special blocks. So these are like slideshow, swipe, sidecar, and guided tour. Uh, the first one I want to talk to you about is slideshow. So we're going to go over here and add a slideshow. When you first prompt, you get the option to you know, add some media. You can add media, an image, a video, or a map. In this case, uh, we have not done nearly enough penguin photos. So I'm going to drop in maybe another penguin photo here. Let's see if it'll let me put this one in. There we go. And so now we have a picture of a penguin. Um, but what you can't see is that, you know, there's much more to that penguin and it actually has a chick. So you see two furry chicks now that I've, I guess not furry, uh, feathered, fluffy, fluffy feathered chicks. Um, as I adjust where that image is placed, I also can say, you know, hey, this is a penguin. And maybe I don't like that placement, so I'm going to move it over to the side and make the color a little more transparent. And I can go on and add, you know, more media. I can add as many, as many slides as I want. You know, this is a great picture of ice that I took. It has an iceberg, so this is ice. And now it's over the iceberg, so I'll drop it down to the bottom. Um, and, and I wanna say that slideshows are really great for breaking up horizontal or vertical scrolling. So we have something that we like to call scroll fatigue. If you're building a really long scroll or story, you wanna give your audience an option to kind of break that up with the interactive blocks that you use. So in this case, we've added in a nice horizontal component. Ross also mentioned swipe. Swipe is one of my favorite blocks. It's really great for showing before for or after or comparing different images. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you a picture that I took in black and white and in color. And it's really interesting to just use it to hammer home those differences. And they're also really fun to play with. So this is a, a crowd favorite regardless, um, but it's super, super helpful. You can also use a guided tour. And so there's a lot of different options for what type of guided tour you you want to build. And so when you first select guided tour, it asks you, do you want to start from scratch? Do you want to upload photos? Or do you want to start with a feature service? Meaning, do you want to start with a survey one, two, three, or a web layer that you've already created? In this case, I'm going to start from scratch. And then it gives me the option of guided tour or explorer tour. If you have a lot of points or a lot of content that you're trying to display, I would recommend using an explorer tour because these tours really let the reader go through them at their own leisure. There's less of a kind of, you know, I wanna say kind of directed experience. If you use a guided tour like the one I'm going to select now, it pulls your reader towards and through a specific series of points. I also have the choice to make it map focused or media focused. If you have really great media, you'll wanna choose media focused to really show that off. But if you're trying to showcase something with your cartography or with a trend in a map, go ahead and use map focused. In this case, I'm biased, I'm using my own pictures. So I'm gonna go ahead and use um, media focused and I'm gonna show a picture of, let's see, somebody, a videographer taking care, uh, taking, taking video of, of a, a penguin, penguin colony. So, you know, this, is a human. 
we don't have a penguin, it's a human, and I'm gonna add that location. So I can go ahead and I can add the tour point to somewhere on the peninsula just by zooming. Um, and I wanna use the current zoom level. And then maybe I also will add another image or video here. And I happen to know that I took a bunch of pictures of icebergs around a specific location. So I'm gonna go ahead and search for that location. And I'm gonna search for Port Lockroy. Um, which is actually the southernmost uh, post office in the world, fun fact. Um, I did send myself a postcard from there. It was super cool, I have it at home. Um, and so now I've created a map tour where my readers get pulled kind of through my experience on, on the Antarctic Peninsula. The last block I'm gonna talk to you about today is going to be our sidecar block. And this is one of my favorite blocks. Again, you're kind of prompted between two different options. Floating panel is really great if you wanna highlight the content behind it. And docked panel is really helpful if you wanna have you know, some additional content, maybe add more images to go along with a map or graphics. In this case, I'm going to choose docked. And I'm gonna actually ask my coworkers, Amelia and Michelle, to go ahead and add in a link in the chat. So I went ahead and we're going to demonstrate something called crowdsourcing. Um, and so one of my favorite techniques is crowdsourcing information, it's participatory GIS. And so right now there's a map um, and all of your responses as you slowly start to fill them out are going to show up on this map and it'll automatically update. And maybe I wanna highlight some of those specific options. So I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate it. And then I'm going to change the map extent. So let's see, whoever is over here, we're gonna put you on display um, and see who likes, ah, Ross, you definitely like emperor penguins. Um, and so now we've done something really quickly called crowdsource where I've used a survey one, two, three to display participatory data in a story, which is really great for connecting with your audience. And then I've also simultaneously done something called map choreography, where I've started with one map extent, kind of a larger one, and I'm pulling in your focus to a specific portion of, of that data set, right, that I wanna highlight. In this case, I wanna highlight that Ross, Ross likes emperor penguins the best. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for a question and answer section. We've gone through some of the basics, some of the advanced things. And I guess the last thing I wanna say before I do that is make sure that you're adding proper attribution. So I wanna thank Ross for his wonderful, wonderful introduction. And I also wanna thank, uh, add proper attribution for that penguin audio since that was the only thing that I didn't uh, take myself that I used in this story. Um, we wanna make sure we're attributing credit and giving folks the proper recognition that they need. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. Can I ask a question? Since I'm thinking about my story map, Liz. Uh, so my question is on the uh, story map, like do you have a, how do you start working on it? Do you just go ahead with playing around with various, uh, uh, you know, options, or do you have something in your head and you want to plan it out in your head first, have a whole map ready map in the sense, at least you know where your story is headed instead of like, you know, so you've written down your story, but you don't know the displays. So do you, do you just play around with it as you go along or do you have something in your head already? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are a bunch of different ways to go about this. So this is gonna be a really subjective answer. Um, and, and what I like to do is I like to separate my story into kind of two categories. Is it a story where I already have the narrative and I'm looking for data and multimedia to support that narrative? Or is it a story where I have the data and I'm looking to tell the story of that data? And they're slightly different things, right? Um, and so am I, it just, it starts, am I building around a narrative or am I building around data and data visualizations? And ultimately they get you to the same place, but you start in different areas. 
And then I'm a super visual person. Most of my team has seen at some point or another, I have in another room, I have a whiteboard usually behind me and it's like full of like my own scribbles. And I like to just actually draw out my story. So I like to take a piece of paper or a whiteboard and just try and build out a structure that I think works for me. And so it might just be like up here, we have, you know, a floated image and then we have text and then maybe there's a sidecar and then slowly I'll start to work through it um, and actually test it out in the builder. And from there, I think about things like the visual language. So the theme of my story, we can communicate through words, we can communicate through data and visualizations, but that third element is kind of the colors you use, the treatments you put on images, right? Those little smaller things that really set the tone in a subtle way or not so subtle way, right? For the story you're trying to tell. And so once I've got my, you know, my whiteboard generalization and I've got an idea of the colors and themes, I just throw it all in the builder. I put in some placeholder text and I just give it a go and then bother all of my teammates over and over again until, until they tell me it actually looks good. Um, so have somebody else look at it too. Other questions? You know, one thing I might add is that, you know, storytelling is an iterative process. Nobody kind of creates one story that's perfect the first time around. Um, and so knowing that going into it gives yourself some freedom to be creative and to try um, different, different techniques. Um, I often think about sort of the videography process of creating a storyboard where you have sort of scene one or like, you know, the cover of your story you know, what's the title, what's the subtitle? And then you're kind of scene two is like, okay, who are those characters like Brayton mentioned? What's the kind of context and background? Scene three, and again, if you're a visual person, just try sketching out little boxes and that can help sort of start creating that creative storytelling process. I would also say Ross is 100% correct. It is iterative that if you're between blocks or you're not quite sure how to visualize something, make both and like put them side by side and see which experience you think works better. So a lot of times, like I might start with a map and then I might realize that there's so much data on the map, it's overwhelming. And I can't just throw my audience right into the map. And, and then I'll transition over to a sidecar and I'll show them the full map extent first, and then I'll use map choreography to call out certain areas or trends that I want them to notice. Otherwise, it would just get completely lost in the larger noise, you know? Um, but just make sure you're, you're playing around with it. I'm, I'm biased, and I, even though I am employed by Esri, I too, like, truly believe this is fun. Um, so it's a really fun process. It's a fun, fun builder. And so just like go for it and see what you end up with. I think there's a hand raised in the chat. Great, I'll see you. You can go ahead and come off mute and ask your question. Yes, you have a question. You have your hand raised. That we were trying to upload a CSV file link onto the ArcGIS Maps platform, but whenever we did, it was showing server error and we couldn't upload the data onto there. So, could you please guide us how to um, fix that? So, one of the things if you're using a CSV to upload data into a map, um, there are a few different ways you can do it, and there are a couple of blogs out there that maybe one of my coworkers can find while I'm trying to work through your question. But essentially, you can drag and drop a CSV directly into the map window in the map viewer or the map viewer classic. But what's really important is that that CSV has to have a location kind of component. And so one of the biggest things that we see when folks kind of run into a troubleshooting problem with this workflow 
is that they may not have included a proper location column or component to their data. Um, so I would recommend going back in and checking to make sure that you have the location part correctly oriented and then dragging and dropping again and seeing if it displays. Um, from there, if that still doesn't work, feel free to shoot myself or Ross an email and we can try and dig into that. I'll drop my email in the chat and we can see what's what's going on with that as well. Okay, thank you. It's really exciting that you're using a CSV and adding, uh, adding a more maps to your stories. Um, <clears throat> I'll just mention that um, you can always email our eco ambassadors one at gmail.com account with any questions. Um, and we can try to connect you to the right person who can help you solve that issue. Um, and again, we will be having our office hour, virtual office hour session next week on the 22nd, or we can also help publish you. Um, so, so yeah, I'll put that email there, but um, thank you Liz for volunteering to help field that one as well. Um, I just wanna mention also that we, we have Michelle Thomas, um, who's a community and web manager from Esri Story Maps team, as well as Amelia Semprebong, um, who's a community specialist with the team. Um, help answer questions as well. So it can be any question you have. If you're trying to think about what topic you want to focus on, if you're having any technical issues, please, if you just want to make some comments or, or see who's interested in what you're working on, um, please, we want to hear from you. Ooh, we well, have just, sorry. Oh, yeah. We were going to call it the same question, all you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a great question that just came through in the chat. It's how do you balance providing information and making an interesting story? I'm making a story about a historic folk song and finding it hard to make it into a kind of story. Um, and I would say the first one, and I am so guilty of this because I consider myself to be a super nerd, right? Is that like, I think that everything is so interesting and like want to provide all of the information about every single component all the time. And in reality, other people probably think I'm boring, right? And I'm not saying you're boring. I'm not saying your story is boring, but I, I, I do wanna like say that, you know, like we as folks with like beautiful dynamic interests and really cool storytelling topics usually wanna tell and showcase every part of that story, right? My guilty pleasure is Penguin and Rocks. I talk far too much about both of them. Um, but I will say that there is, there is a balance, right? So when you're thinking about the folk song that you're trying to kind of break down, I would think about like, what are the important like top level things that are essential to communicating the importance of that folk song, communicating to you know the importance of perhaps its cultural relevance, maybe it's personal ties to your life if it has one. Think about kind of the bigger things that may drop or, or draw an audience member in, and then kind of litter in little little pieces, little extra facts here or there that add character, that add a little bit of flavor, you know, add a little bit additional depth and context, but don't overwhelm your audience with just all of this really awesome information all at once. And you can use things like the structure of your story, the immersive blocks that you choose, right? Even the maps and how you present them, you know, whether or not you use a guided map tour or an explorer tour, or you use an immersive or a docked panel, right? How you pull the reader through that information matters too. So if you're gonna pull them in really deep to something, then you can zoom it back out a little bit. Um, and at the end of the day, just make sure that whatever you're doing, you're starting one place, but you're ultimately ending up where you wanna be. So find that one connecting le uh, line through everything through every part of the story of that folk song and then slowly build the components out so you tell it in a manner that keeps your audience engaged. And I know Ross has some thoughts on this subject, so I'm gonna toss it over to him too. I, I love these kinds of questions. Um, and I think it's so universal, especially when you're doing a topic that's near and dear to yourself, like Liz mentioned. Um, again, like, I sound like a broken record, but I always think about audience and purpose, right? So if your audience is 
a historic folk song convention, you know, you're going to take a different approach than, you know, engaging children, engaging adults who have no background in historic folk songs, right? And so starting there and then thinking about, you know, what are the most important information I want to provide in this short digital story that I'll be creating. Um, that's honestly, that's the craft of storytelling. You're like, fundamentally, this question is like, how do you craft a narrative that is effective? Um, and again, it, it becomes subjective, but it, but rooting it in your audience and purpose always helps to create more effective stories. Um, I think, you know, there's also a desire to like use every single interactive block that's in the builder. And I can't stress enough that don't do that <laughs> unless it's really important to your story. It can just be a jarring experience. Um, one element that I think could be really cool for your, for your story is the audio functionalities within ArcGIS story maps. Um, you can add those as background audio. You can add them as inline audio. And in doing so, you can reduce the amount of text you have to give but provide these audio snippets that engage the senses. You can also write out the lyrics to the song, maybe using the quote block. And that can be a really engaging way to bring people into this beautiful, rich um, tradition um, without needing to go into every single uh, detail that perhaps we, we like yearn to do, but you can break it up into multiple stories that will um, can't wait to see what you create. That's such yeah. a cool topic. I'm, I'm super excited for this and want to like plus 3000 to Ross's suggestion about using audio. It adds a totally different element to your story and it makes it usually like more human, more relatable too. kind of um, piggyback on that, do you think, you know, as you're thinking about that balance and kind of providing a more cohesive, concise story that embedding links and things like that is a good way to sort of, oh, this thing is interesting to you, you can go here and learn more about that without having to have it all there in one place. I'm going to say yes and no. Okay. It's the worst type of answer ever. Um, yes you should 100% provide additional context if it's needed or linked to, to specific things you're referencing. But when I was talking about buttons and calls to action, I mentioned stickiness. And so we live in a digital age and you know, story map stories, they're a digital medium and you want people to get to the end of your story. And so if you have too many links or you call too much attention to outside information, there's always a chance they may click on it and you know, it pulls them out into a separate window and then they get lost in something else and not your incredible story that you've worked super hard on. And so I would find those links that are like absolutely necessary for providing that additional context or providing reference. And I would hyperlink them and I would do it in a way that, you know, gives a visual indicator that, you know, hey, there may be more information about this topic, but doesn't call a ton of attention to it. And then use things like buttons, those graphics to call out like, hey, I actually want you to expand this app that I made, you know, in another window because I want you to see it bigger. I want you to play with it. Or at the end, I want you to interact with this. I, this is a call to action. I want you to click on this and go to this place where you can do something really tangible. I would, I would say definitely do it in that way, but find, find that really nice balance because less is more here too. It's like, don't use every interactive block and also don't link absolutely everything you can. We've got about 10 more minutes for questions. Or if anyone wants to share ideas of what you're putting together so far, what you're thinking about, we'd love to hear that too. I have an idea and a question. 
Oh, Sophia, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Sorry, I was clicking like accidentally clicked like the clapping button and the check mark on accident all at once <laughs> instead of the raising hand button. Um, but um, I was interested in maybe, and I think, you know, especially when we're touching base with like the audio and all like these different features. And I like the idea of engaging all the senses um, of capturing um, the attention of like, maybe the reader and kind of like scrolling fatigue and how to make sure they stay engaged throughout it. And what is maybe um, to like, kind of just like a advice into like, especially starting it engaging. And so you can maintain that focus and maybe not something too long or not something too short, like what's a good medium. Ross, do you want to jump in on this? Or do you want me to take a first first stab at it? I can start and you can you can react too. Um, scroll fatigue is real. I think we've all experienced scroll fatigue and it's um, it's common now with digital media, right? Because you, you can just, whether it's a mobile experience or whether it's a desktop experience, you can just go and go and go. Um, <clears throat> I like to think about having these anchors within your story to draw people's attention back and focus folks folks back on what you're trying to communicate. You know, there's this uh, concept in cartography called visual hierarchy. And I think it also applies really well to visual storytelling um, because, you know, in cartography, you've got all of these different layers of information and you want the most important information or the most, you know, the, the critical information for your story in your map to rise to the top. So that might be larger text, darker colors, things like that, you know, will really pop to the top. And so within your digital story, I would say the same thing applies. Having header text, that's going to be emphasized more for somebody's eye and, and cognitive load than just your regular paragraph text. You can also use color. Again, can be overused, but a, a color can really grab reader's attention and keep them engaged and then reinforce the core concepts you're trying to communicate. There's also ways within the builder to break up that scroll fatigue by using certain blocks. So you, you've probably noticed that a number of the blocks are very uh, vertically driven like sidecar, map tour. Um, the slide show block is a horizontal block. So it, it shows a a series of images horizontally. And so that can change the pace of your story, the pace of reading through your content. Um, so it's something that so exciting that you're already thinking about this because a lot of people spend a lot of time authoring a story and they just add another block, add another block. <clears throat> and pretty soon you have this monumental dissertation, amazing content, but the majority of folks won't get to the end of your story because they'll get bored or they'll, you know, get a notification that somebody is chatting them, da da da, and you lose their attention and then they're gone. And so, again, I'm just kind of, I'm starting to rant now, but um, I think there's there's some nuggets in there to emphasize. So, again, keeping your story simple and to the point. You don't need to sort of don't bury the lead, don't bury the most important information at the bottom as like this buildup because oftentimes folks won't get there. Think about how long you want your readers to sort of engage with your story. If again, depending on your audience, you're going to develop the length of your story to meet them. If your story is getting long, consider making multiple stories so that they can go into a collection of stories. These topics are complex, right? They're multifaceted. There are so many stories within stories within stories that you could pursue. And again, you know, you are, you are self-editing as you go. What will I include, but what will I leave out? And so the more you can sort of balance telling a complete story and a truthful story with excluding really important information so that people don't get bored. That's that's a hard balance that we continue on our team to weigh. 
um, again, coming back to the audience purpose, that helps inform it. Um, I would also say adding things like quotes, quote blocks from authoritative sources or from you know, people you interview in your story, those bring a really, you know, first of all, they, in terms of that visual hierarchy, they call out attention to that, that quote. And then also what they say is going to be interesting for your readers and perhaps more interesting than, you know, sort of narrative that's more sort of informative than really interesting examples or anecdotes that they can use. Um, so I would, I would use those features. And then also think about engaging the senses using color, using that, again, that visual hierarchy of digital storytelling, but also that audio engage people's, um, yeah, through perhaps it's an interview or perhaps it's the sound of water crashing on a beach. They can be very subtle ambient noises that will keep people engaged as opposed to, you know, things that distract um, or are jarring for a reader. Over to you, Liz. <laughs> yeah, those some really great tips. One thing that I will say, and this might sound incredibly counterintuitive, um, but repetition is sometimes your best friend. So Ross talked about a visual hierarchy. And, you know, when you're trying to get at things like storytelling and, you know, the feel of your story and how to keep people in it, you want to create a story structure with that, that rich text editor. So you want to use things like headings and subheadings and specific types of, you know, text blocks. And you want to follow that with a familiar feeling. So when I think about stories, a story that does this really well, I think, is the story that Ross talked about, about tropical cyclones and tropical storms. You know, each section of that story has a really similar structure. So while it's a really long story, each of them kind of feel, feel familiar. And the audience, it's really easy for an audience to slip into the story and then you move to the next one and it progresses in a similar and familiar manner. And so you wanna try and build out a structure that builds familiarity as well. Um, and kind of creates a, a cadence that moves people through your story at, at a, in, in a way that, that keeps them engaged. And I do love Ross's um, suggestion of making it a collection. So if your story is truly that long, pick a story structure, make an introductory story, right? That gives context to what you're gonna talk about and then break it down into bite-sized pieces and have it feel kind of similar in each one, maybe use the same theme or the same separator or you know, similar graphic elements to give it all you know, a thread that goes throughout them, but, but give people the chance to explore it at their own pace, you know, in, the own, in their own order. You know? um, collections are really, really helpful and they're also incredibly underutilized. Um, so, so that's a, a really good way to, to pull people in without overwhelming them. And then the third tip I'll give you, and this is something we see a lot when, you know, we have a, an author that's a subject matter expert that, um, that wants to, you know, really get into the weeds. Like if I could write a story that was, I don't know, however many lines, like incredibly long about rocks, I would. But like very few people are gonna read my story about rocks. I like really truly have a passion for them. And I was a geology major in undergrad and, could like what I'm pretty sure wax poetic poetic might be a stretch but I could talk about rocks for days um and so I might make an introductory story to my favorite rocks and then make another longer story that I link to at the end and I'm like hey all you folks who also love rocks like come check this out this is a real like in-depth approach to my favorite rocks on a whole nother level um so you can either you can either break it up you can give folks different story options. You can look at structure. You can look at visual hierarchy. There are a lot of ways to do this, but ultimately you you know what's right for your story that you're trying to tell. So take everything we've just said with about five pounds of salt and, and figure out what you need and what you wanna do with, with the story you're telling. Thank you so much. I, th those are so many great tips um, and I think 
we're, we're in the final few minutes of our workshop here. So I want to um, go ahead and share screen and, and go over some next steps. But if people still have questions, please put them in the chat. And if we have a few minutes at the end or people are willing to stay a couple more minutes, we can, we can still revisit those. Um, so I just want to emphasize that you know, we know this is a lot to take in at once. It's a new skill set. It's a, a new platform for many of us. So we do have this learn path um, that Ezri has been kind enough to, to help us put together that goes has videos, has modules, really goes through the step by step that you can use at your own pace. Um, and that link is in the chat already, but we can share it again. Um, and we'll share it in a follow up email after this workshop as well. So this is a great place where you can go on your own time and keep practicing these skills and the uh, recorded session for this, as well as our other sessions again are on our YouTube channel. Um, so our next steps um, for any of you who have not gotten set up with your free Esri license to use our GIS online and to use story maps. Um, we encourage you to please uh, submit your research topic or at least an idea of what you're thinking about as soon as possible. Uh, the link is here and we'll share that in the chat again as well. Um, and then once you once you do that, we'll on our end set up uh, your account. So it's not automated. So if you don't get an email immediately after submitting, don't worry, we're checking every day and we'll send you that uh, email and you'll get it from ArcGIS notifications. Um, and then we're, we're still setting a date, but in August, so you'll have about a month to start putting your drafts together. We'll have a draft sharing session and all these things, all these wonderful tips that Ross and Liz have shared with us about how to find that balance of sharing information, but keeping it sticky and interesting. We'll be able to share those uh, feedback with each other during that workshop. So that'll be a great opportunity. Um, I also just wanted to mention, you know, one of the goals for our team with this whole program is that some of the story maps that you all create could potentially serve as lesson plans or resources that teachers can use in classrooms to help teach about some of these key issues. So thinking about the length, you know, and kind of the structure of it, that call to action at the end could be, you know, a kind of activity that learners could, could then take out into their communities or do on their own, something to kind of bring that learning to life for, for the learners. Um, that's just another way to think of it, you know, for us as we're thinking about kind of the length and how to structure it, that maybe some of these can serve as like a lesson plan that would fit into that kind of, you know, 30 minute, uh, bring in some information and then have a call to action kind of learning uh, activity that could come after that. So just, just some more ideas to think about. Um, and then again, we have the learn path link here. And we'll be planning that office hour session next week, July 22nd from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll have some Esri experts there. So again, any technical issues, questions you have, we'll send that link out the day before. And we encourage you to, to join and bring those questions so we can discuss some more once you're getting into it. And we know more questions will arise as you go. Um, so that's it in terms of next steps. And uh, we want to thank all of our wonderful speakers and partners, SDGs Today, Esri, uh, for being here with us today. We've learned so much. Um, and so thanks so much. I think that's it for today. But if anybody does have any additional questions, please, we can, we can stay a few more minutes and, and discuss a bit more. So thank you. Uh, Andy is here with us. I just wanted to just maybe give him like five, 10 minutes, Andy, if, uh, because I don't think this session will be complete without your intervention. Maybe if you can just give us some tips on um, your storytelling techniques. Uh, it's great that uh, uh, you've been able to join us. I'm just so sorry that I screwed up. I have two different Google calendars and uh, you, probably some of you have these situations sometimes and I just missed the reminder. And I just feel terrible about that, but it's you're in great hands. Esri is a remarkable um, uh, entity that's kind of building a toolkit for storytelling in different ways that are invaluable. I just posted some links to in the chat box. Um, I did a session on my webcast series at the Earth Institute fairly early last year with Dawn Wright at Esri, who's their chief scientist. And we were talking about mapping as, as storytelling. Um, I have been a conventional storyteller most of my life, meaning books, uh, five books, uh, magazine articles way back in the day, things like this. Very, it's, it's an antique 1988 cover story on global warming that had pretty much everything that's been going on in the world around us ever, ever since then. Um, and I, but I do feel that if I were to start over, well, I, I shouldn't say to start over in the 1980s, that's what we did. Journalism was 
one-way direction stuff. I reported, I thought, I wrote, I sent it out, and maybe a few readers would send a letter to the editor. Now the landscape is so rich, and it's really not nearly as much about storytelling as story sharing. The, the more that anyone thinks about audiences and who's, <laughs> what's the value of exposition, putting something out versus uh, listening, getting a sense of what people are already thinking and um, conversation, meaning we care about an endangered species. What do we do? The, I, I run an initiative at Columbia on, on innovation and communication. Most of what I think about is conversational, not one way. So that's the one thing to think about. I'm, I'm launching a column shortly, uh, a newsletter, but newsletters even are one direction. The, the newsletter I'm going to create is much more about building conversations. I just finished um, setting up a post I'm going to do on what I call watch words. Think about a word, think about climate crisis. And I guarantee even among you, there'll be three or four different definitions of that word. And the only way to have common ground, the only way to seek a solution is to start with some basic understanding of the terms we use. And that comes through listening and um, civility, which don't seem possible sometimes on the, uh, on the internets. Uh, but, but Twitter and, and these, these media, these social media are, are at your service. You can use them actively to, to build a community that cares about things that's not just uh, ranting. And, and even there, I just yesterday, just finally, I was talking with um, a psychologist in England uh, from Plymouth. Oh, actually, she's now in Vienna. Uh, Sabine Paul, P-A-H-L, and she studies the psychology of behavior change related to information. You know, which pictures of, of an elephant are more apt to change someone's behavior? The picture of the thriving elephant or the slaughtered elephant? We actually don't know much about that yet. Even National Geographic doesn't know much about that. So, so starting with those primary questions feels like, oh my God, do we have to start there? But I think it's where progress comes from. Peeling back thinking about the basic factors that could lead to a better planet, uh, thinking about who, you know, who to have in a conversation, getting outside of bubbles. We are kind of a bubble here right now. We all care about these issues already. Um, but we know that we have friends who might feel like they don't care about it, but who still like to go out for a walk or go hunting or fishing, uh, even though we wouldn't hunt or hunt. We might find a way for, to have that conversation going forward. So I hope that that orientation is helpful. It's, it's really not mechanistic the way I think about progress on the planet now in terms of story. It's about building a system for exchange of information that can do marvelous things. One last quick example I should post in the chat. Early last year, um, there's a guy named Dan Hammer. If you just search for that name, Dan Hammer, and uh, Amazon and um, Earthrise, one word, He's built a portal that allows students anywhere to sift satellite data showing deforestation patterns in the rainforest, for example. And there were students at high schools in Iowa and in Massachusetts last year who helped to identify incursions of gold mining into an Indian reserve, the Yanomami territory in the Amazon, using remote sensing data, mostly NASA data. And then that helped Reuters journalists for the Reuters news agency create a story. So you had students, data, and journalists together doing, and, and Indian groups, the Anamami, together doing something that individually they could never do. So finding those intersections is really important too. And I'm so sorry I came in late. I just feel terrible. Thank you so much, Andy. I think this, this conversation idea was very helpful. I don't know if Tara has any major points to repeat from Andy's uh, intervention there. No, I just like the, the emphasis on, you know, the interaction, you know, the, the way we can tell stories now, we can create those opportunities to keep listening and keep sharing. And that's, that's what story maps and all, you know, ability to crowdsource data that we can then show in these story maps. It's such an exciting opportunity that we have. And I think, thank you so much, Andy, for joining us as our grand finale to our, our event today. And um, we're so honored to have you all here with us and we thank you all for the great insights that you shared today. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions for, for Andy or any of our other speakers before we close today.
Okay, Betsy has a question. In a story map, how might we gauge or measure audience interaction? Mm. Liz. All right, uh, you can actually add Google Analytics tracking to your story. If you have a Google Analytics account, Ross actually wrote an incredible blog about just how to do that. Um, something we've also done in our own stories is add a quick survey one, two, three embedded using an iframe at the end. So that makes it really interactive. And it's just like a, hey, how did you like this story? It's like a five-star rating. It essentially is, we use a Likert scale to do it. So you could either do a survey one, two, three at the end and ask for direct feedback, or you can use Google Analytics to, to track things more formally. Um, Ross, anything else to add? No, I think that's, that's great. Oh, and I like Andrew also added this point that we we can make sure we can add uh, some kind of easy portal for questions, um, which is what Survey One Two Three does. If you if you all just oh, I can share my I don't know if you all remember that map I showed earlier. Um, let me see if I can share it again real quick. The, so the survey, the topic submission we've asked you all to complete on our website is an embedded Survey One Two Three survey. And these dot, that's how we made this map because it automatically fills in all of your data with your projects. If you actually were to, I think in the email reminder we sent for this session, there was a link to the map. So if you have your account, you should be able to access it and you can see you know, who's where and what, what projects they're interested in working on in this map just because of that survey. So it's, it's super easy and it's super exciting and a great way to bring that interactive piece. Um, so thank you all for pointing that out. We have a visitor. Ross, I think you have to introduce the cat. <laughs> my cat, Rai, he's very, <laughs> he loves being my coworker. <laughs> very snuggly. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Any other final questions? And just uh, we'll, we'll send a follow up email to everyone who has registered for this session that will have the recorded version of this, all the links that were shared. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, keep you all updated on when that on the office hour session for next week for any questions. And then again, for the August session, when we will uh, share some of our draft story maps with each other. So thank you all so much for being part of the session today. And uh, we'll see you next time.